Um, well, welcome everyone. It's uh, 11.03 uh, and I wanted to say thank you for joining us. We'll be with you for an hour and uh, I'm excited. We have a really interesting panel, great people who I uh, respect and admire and, and appreciate spending some time with me. So as you see on the screen, we're joined today by Chris Heck, who's the president of the Philadelphia 76ers. Hey, Chris. Hey, Greg. Thanks for having me. Jennifer Leitman, who is a CMO and brand strategist and the former EVP of marketing from the Francis Ford Coppola Wineries out in California. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, nice to see everybody. And Vincent Sharps, who's a friend and business partner at MindGrub here in the Baltimore market, and he is the EVP and chief business officer. Hey, Vince. Hey, man. I am going to stop sharing my screen because we're mostly just going to have a conversation today. And uh, I, I really appreciate everyone chiming in. A couple of kind of rules of the road as we get into it, which is that uh, as we're, we're going to talk for about 45 minutes on this topic of marketing planning for 21 and how to do that in times of uncertainty. We're also going to talk about what's working now and some trends we're seeing. Uh, but we want you to participate as well. So at, uh, toward the end of the discussion, maybe around the 45 minute mark, we'll take some questions. Um, you can submit a question in one of a couple ways. You can chat to the panelists using the chat functionality. If you hover at the bottom, you should also see a Q&A button. If you tap that Q&A button, you can put a question in and we can get to it a little later. Um, and then there's a way to raise your hand. If you go to participants and look at your name, you should be able to put your hand up. And um, we, we might be able to take some audio later, but I, I think the best way to do it would be to chat or use the Q&A. So that's enough on that. Uh, this is the latest in our uh, webinar series dating back to March, uh, where we've had a focus on communicating in a crisis. Today's theme is marketing and communications planning for 21, building your brand during times of uncertainty. And remember, uh, we will record it. If you have a colleague or friend you want to share the content with later, we'll be sending that in the next couple of days. All right, so I want to get right into it. And uh, one of the things I'm most interested in is to hear from all of you about what is the right way to plan at a time when there's so much uncertainty in the world with the election coming next week, uh, with the pandemic still the top of the news cycle. And of course, with the racial injustice movement and other things happening in our world, how might any company or organization approach planning at this time of the year? Um, uh, Chris, let's start with you at the 76ers. And first of all, congratulations on the hiring of Daryl Morey, your new GM. We saw that news yesterday. That was a really big deal. And I know it's probably an odd time because you want to be excited about building the team and what the future holds, but then it's also very, um, you know, difficult to figure out what you'll be able to do. So I'm curious what the Sixers are doing right now. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Greg. Um, you know, it, it, it's such, it's been such a wild ride uh, this summer. I think our whole world um, has uh, been turned upside down. We've all been awakened. We all have pivoted. Um, all these key words that are, um, are like living uh, five lifetimes. And in the middle of it, we have been um, trying to think about the present, but also the future. So, um, and with a basketball team and the success that the NBA had with the bubble, which was just tremendous uh, with zero, um, zero uh, people conducting COVID uh, or having COVID uh, over that uh, bubble period, which was almost three months. Um, was nothing short of remarkable. But we, we exited a lot for, uh, earlier than we thought we would. So, um, so we got to a point where like, well, the sentiment of our team was, was at an all time low um, mm. from disappointment. So how, how do you exit and, the playoffs? The Sixers didn't advance. So that's right, yeah. yeah, that's right. And so, uh, so meanwhile, um, you know, after spending a very aggressive summer of being active and being, um, responsible and responsive uh, to the environment of the world, um, we found ourselves in this precarious spot where people didn't want to hear from us. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we really started thinking about the things that we could control. Um, and we moved everything to um, promoting democracy and get out to vote, as opposed to normally promoting our players or our brand and so forth. And we thought that um, that was the the right direction for us. So yeah. now we're in the next, getting ready for the next phase, and uh, that's return for the next season, which there's a lot of unknown as well. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's where I've been on this whirlwind, like the rest of everyone on this call, 
has been yeah. their own pers- uh, businesses. Well, I'll get to Vince and Jennifer in a second, but a quick follow-up for you, Chris, is like you, we talked before this about scenario planning. So you give everyone just a sense for like, you know, you run a major professional sports franchise. I think everyone's kind of curious about like the ability to return to games and concerts and things. And like, so how are the Sixers envisioning the world in the end of 20 and into 21 about like going to a game? Is that even on the table right now? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We're in full preparation for so. Um, you know, right now, if things opened up today, um, our state and city uh, restrictions would prevent us from having fans uh, in arena. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't prepare for all scenarios. So we are preparing everything from having a thousand fans all the way um, to half capacity uh, at over 10,000 uh, per game. Um, you know, oddly enough, this summer, we actually sold more season tickets than any other team in the NBA. We're number one in the league in sales uh, because we got after it so aggressively. When most people, most teams uh, in most sports uh, either cut back, cut, cut back their staff, um, we said, let's flip it the other way. Let's get aggressive. And if we can't um, capitalize it on this coming season, meaning 2021, then we will be better prepared for 21-22. Right. So we're playing a long game here, and uh, we're, not, um, we're not cutting. And that's why we hire, uh, you know, somebody, a, a great mind in basketball operations, a great new coach. Uh, we're actually being very uh, active in the marketplace. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I think that the, one of the things that I think everybody wants to hear is a little bit of optimism about what can I look forward to. And certainly sports and entertainment provide that um, with the appropriate amount of uh, caveats for what might be possible. Um, let's go to you, Vincent. You work probably, I think, more with B2B brands, some consumer, right? But like, how are you and your team at, at MindGrub? And, and for everyone who doesn't know MindGrub, um, it's a local agency that specializes in technology and marketing and, and digital and uh, Vince, you, know, you can pick that up and run with it. Sure. So we're, you know, we're a, a consultancy and agency based in Baltimore. Um, we build, you know, digital products for enterprise brands and full service agency marketing. Uh, but Chris said, you know, five lifetimes ago, I think my favorite meme is, you know, I remember what I was doing three years ago at the beginning of COVID, right? And <laughs> You know, we've seen some brands do some incredible marketing, you know, from Levi's to Google to Netflix. Um, Speaking about, you know, voting, we have a trifecta of events going on worldwide. We have the pandemic, we have the election, um, and of course we have the social justice movement. And you've seen some, some marketing that's going on that doesn't say anything about the product or widget that companies are selling, but it speaks totally to their brand because it means that they're employee centric right now. And if you're not marketing to your employee, now that the big companies, uh, you know, the big tech companies for us in our space are now starting to recruit nationwide. If you're not marketing to your employee as much as you are to your your buyer, um, then that's a mistake. Um, So, you know, my my first mentor told me, um, if you serve your employees and the community, that keeps your company in business, the business will come. I never thought that would apply so much to marketing um, as it does now. So, you know, if you, if you stay on brand, if you're mindful, if you have empathy to the fact that your clients are in a strange position right now, that your employees um, are dealing with an unprecedented situation, if you stay on top of that, I just got back from um, Mind Grub's leadership offsite. Of course, we wore masks and we kept social distancing. But we just did our you know 2021 planning. We talked about the employee more than we talked about the industries and the service lines that we're going to uh, tackle in 2021. Yeah, speaks to the moment. Um, yeah, speaking for- to the moment is huge. And I think well, l- let me let me throw it to Jen for a second because Jennifer, you you you've worked in the um, the wine business, and I know you're consulting with wineries and other consumer brands right now. And tell us a little bit about planning, because uh, maybe that's one of the areas where you can lend some insight on uh, how people can be thinking about what to plan for now. 
Yeah, sure. So I think the the brands that have done well this year are the ones that have been able to be flexible. It's because they knew who they were. So I look at Patagonia, which I think is great. I look at Lego, Ben and Jerry's. There's several different brands out there. And I think they they know so clearly what they stand for so they can act quickly. So if I were looking at 2021 and deciding how to plan, I think that's where you start is you have to know what is your vision? What do you stand for in terms of social responsibility? Who are your consumers? And that way you can act quickly. Because I don't think that's going to change. So it's really like starting at the foundation, defining what, what you stand for. And I think Patagonia is interesting to me. It's so clear, right? You, you go to their site, you see all their marketing. It's so clear what they stand for. And there was an example over the summer. If you guys saw, there's a tag on their shorts. It said, vote the a-holes out. <laughs> and, you know, and none of that went through to the CEO. But the, but the people there knew so clearly that that was something that the brand stood for. They could do it. They had the flexibility to get it done. It ended up being a really interesting story. And so if I were giving a, some advice, it would be get together and figure out what you can and can't do, what your filter is, so you can act quickly in 2021. Yeah, acting quickly is such an interesting thing to think about, too, because we've seen things happen that have been viral, like the um, I was playing Dreams before by Fleetwood Mac, and I can pop on my screen the image that I think everybody is familiar with at this time, which is uh, Dogface. Uh, that's the guy's twi uh, TikTok or twi Twitter handle, mm -hmm. um, and who played the Fleetwood Mac song while riding on a skateboard, going to his job at a potato factory. And all of a sudden, he had millions and millions of um, hits and, and shares. And then the next thing you know, um, you know, Fleetwood Mac and Ocean Spray are um, retweeting him and, and rolling it. If you watch the Baseball World Series, you saw um, an advertising campaign from TikTok that talked about, you know, this is what's trending now. So they had to be agile, just jump on that moment. So what do you guys think about that? How, how is, you can't plan to go viral, but well, maybe, maybe the discussion point is like, how to handle it if you do. And then a different question would be like, everybody wants to plan to go viral and is there any way to do that? Um, well, to, to, to start with you. Yeah, just to speak to Jennifer's point, um, you know, as far as marketing is concerned, I don't think we ever would have thought how, what's the right thing to do um, comes up more in marketing discussions about what your planning is gonna be more than ever. Um, and before it, I don't know that I've ever seen what's the right thing to do come come up as much as possible. The NBA, Chris, uh, kudos, they've done it. And personally, I think very well. Um, so, you know, thinking about what's the right thing to do, but of course you still have to sell you whatever it is you're selling. So you, you have to be business minded, but what's the right thing to do has come up certainly more than I, I've ever seen in my career. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Chris, I think I want to ask you about this, uh, the, the, the balance between being a brand or an experience that provides lightness and a distraction in a good way versus being involved in a social movement and kind of having a social responsibility, especially the NBA, because for anyone who watched the playoffs, you know, um, the Black Lives Matter movement was front and center, it was painted on the courts, um, the players' jerseys had um, phrases that supported the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and you could not, if you were going to watch an NBA game during the playoffs, you were going to be seeing that movement. And I'm, I'm sure some people aren't as comfortable with it as others. And, and I guess I'm, I just, I'm sure you've talked a lot about this, but I just want to hear your take from inside an NBA franchise. Like, what was that like for you and your team on the sales and marketing side to to balance, to know that your your players and a lot of the league was all in on this movement, but then also you, you have to, um, you know, represent the brand of the Sixers to a, a big community of advertisers and fans and supporters. And so how did that go? What, what happened? Yeah, no, I mean, listen, I think it was an education of a lifetime, um, particularly for a white male like myself. Um, the biggest takeaway I had was um, to shut up and listen. And, um, you know, it was an awakening. It was an awakening for myself personally, um, as well as for uh, the world. Um, and so uh, for all, for everyone. And, um, and it was, you know, someone said something to me, um, you know, they said, they said, like, you know, where do you want to be? Um, you want to be on the right side of history. 
right? So it was something that um, super sensitive, super real. Um, it, it, it was an awakening. Um, and it was really tricky because you want to be neutral. You want to give people an outlet to enjoy um, sport and uh, particularly the NBA. Um, but we also felt like we had a platform and a uh, responsibility um, to our country um, to respond. And you could criticize, you know, what was the right thing to do um, with uniforms and court and things of that nature. But I think at the end of the day, the right thing would, for at least personally, I believe the right thing was to, um, to shut up and listen and let people talk and have a platform um, so we all could be a little bit uh, more educated and, uh, and open our hearts and minds up. So that was the great takeaway for me. Um, I try to be very neutral. I try to be all inclusive on everything with our team. And, um, and I think this was the right path, um, even though it was so hard and, and quite frankly, uncomfortable. Right. And, and so, so looking ahead, as you know, it's not like the issue went away, it will continue to be discussed. But I, I think I did see a headline that the NBA announced that Black Lives Matter will no longer be painted on the courts. Um, I, yeah, I don't, and, and I think that was the idea was like, listen, let's react um, in this bubble environment uh, in a um, very uniform way. Um, mm -hmm. And so now it is up to the teams and the players as individuals, um, and quite frankly, all of us as, as citizens of the United States to, um, to carry it on. Yeah. So, you know, we have a, a new coach in Doc Rivers who is um, respected, um, proven um, leader, and he is very uh, outspoken and vocal um, in social justice. And so like, we have it a little bit easier because we can work with somebody that's already has that credibility in the marketplace or universally in basketball. Right. You can kind of defer to doc to lead the charge in that issue perhaps. Yeah. So. And, but he, you know, he's not, he's, he's, and that's a great spokesperson for us, but mm -hmm. we also have a chief diversity officer and I work with him almost every day. Um, and we talk about things very openly and honestly in different perspectives. And I think that ultimately that's the idea, right? So let's get out of our own little bubble to you overuse the phrase and, um, and let's open our minds and our hearts uh, to everybody else. And so, and communicate, communicate and listen. And, um, you know, so that's been the, the great takeaway of the pandemic and, and maybe something that we um, think in years, in the future of a positive that came out of 2020. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, it was it was very inspiring to see the, the there was no getting around the fact that the NBA was all in on the issue, and I, I really appreciate and align with your um, your lesson of. I, I will say that. this though, Greg. Like I've had probably equal amount of people mm -hmm. come up to me and say how pleased they were with it and how impressed um but also an equal amount of people saying like stick to basketball right and, and i want to spot I want in that it. regard it's it's really it's 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 hard it's hard but but we're not backtracking and um i think we all feel good about what direction we need to go right I guess, let me throw it over to you, Jennifer, in terms of brands and taking a stand and um, kind of seizing on a moment or, or maybe choosing one to be a part of. One of the brands I think you mentioned that I like to follow is Levi's. Uh, Levi Strauss, their CEO, has taken a very strong and public stance against gun violence. And if you buy Levi's, you kind of are, I don't know, I, I guess I, you know, you, you're probably aware of the fact that Levi's is anti-guns, anti-gun violence, obviously. So, What's your take and how a, a company, a brand should think about um, social causes and how risky is that um, as an endeavor? Wow, you know, I, I, I like what Chris said, being on the right side of history, you know, and that's, that's uncomfortable. Um, 
I think you have to, I, I think you have to take risks. You know, I mean, I, this is my own, I think you have to be able to live with yourself. I think there are two things you're factoring in, right? You have to be able to live with yourself as a person who works there at the end of the day and be able to sleep at night. And there's a financial piece of it too. So you're kind of, you're, you're weighing both of those things. But I think we're in a very interesting point in time where um, you do stand the chance of turning some, some consumers away with your stance and you have to be okay with that. And I think that's part of the, the long-term, you know, sort of growth we have to get to in this society where these are uncomfortable decisions, but you have to be on the right side of history. And there is, there is a right and there is a wrong. And, um, and I, I think that it's, um, it's been very tough. I, I really applaud the, I applaud the brands that have come out very strongly and swiftly. And then you have ones that are sort of like trying to sort of, you know, wink and nod and kind of be on your know, both sides. And, and I, you know, there are a lot of them, I think that are sort of virtue signaling too, that come out with some amazing campaigns. Um, I think, I think Nike, for instance, is one of my favorite brands. I love their campaigns. They're so inspiring, but then I look at their executive team and, you know, and I see a lack of diversity and I think that's, you know, they're being scrutinized for that and um, as they should be. And I think we'll see some good changes. So you, you, you take a risk, you come out with, with um, I think what's right with integrity. And it goes back to knowing who you are as a brand and, and knowing not just who your knowing who your consumers are, but knowing what, what you stand for and the kind of people you want in the world you want to live in. And that's, that's where I think brands need to really look internally. And then when they come out with a campaign, they come out with a message, man, they better believe it and they better act on it. You can't just come out with something that looks pretty. And then when you open, you know, you lift the hood, you're like, what is this? No offense to the white guys in the panel, but why are all these white guys on the executive team and on the board? You know, you better really believe in it and, and live it. Yeah. Is it risky, Jen? I mean, as a follow-up to you, like, is it, is it good business to take a stance on a, uh, a, a an issue uh, that is controversial? I I think so. Yes, I do. I, th I think yeah. I think like I said. I think um, I I do think there's a right and a wrong, you know. And and you have I think taking a stance is is, is correct. And I particularly think when you look at a younger when you look at a younger consumer, a multicultural generation. They want they they expect that too. I mean, we've seen a lot of research over the summer that that says they want to align with brands that reflect who they are and what what their passions are and what they believe in. So yes, now will you lose people? Likely you will, you know, and you have to be able to live with that. But um, yeah, I do. I think it's the right thing to do. Definitely. Vince, let's take it over to you. Uh, same question: How risky is it for brands to align with controversial causes? And what have you seen that's been both inspiring or maybe things that uh, you think went well or didn't go so well? Uh, we've mentioned two that stick out to me, you know, Levi's and Nike have done a very good job of it. Um, but we have a, a median age at Mindgrub, you know, in the, the upper 20s. So we are, our, our employees are those folks that, you know, Jen is talking about. They're passionate about who they work for. They want to make sure that who they work for supports the causes that are as much a part of their life as their family, their job, and what they believe in. Um, so we've really, you know, empowered and lifted up our DEI committee, um, and we support, you know, the the organizations that align with our mission, like Black Girls Who Code, um, and many others. You know, we we send all this work overseas. Um, I, I sit on a board of a, a company that's a workforce development company that's about training, you know, inner city youth and developing a pipeline here in this country to do the development work, to do the creative work instead of sending it near shore or offshore. Those are the type of activities that align with our mission. I think every company should take a hard look at what their mission is and do have similar activities. Um, the MBA has done a great job that, you know, you could, you could name a lot of different companies that are doing it right now. I hope it continues. Um, it's something I'm passionate about. It's something that MindGrub's very passionate about. Um, but we live in a time where your employees want to know that they work at a place that aligns with their values. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't do it, you're going to lose employees. Um, yeah. so something that we talk about, you know, just about every day. That's a really interesting point. It feels like this moment is more um, engaged in that regard than any I can remember in business in, in my professional career. And, and I feel like um, I want to pivot a little bit because the pandemic has been the, it, there have been a lot of huge stories this year, but the pandemic is, is the biggest one because we've all 
started working a different way. We engage with one another a different way in marketing and communications and public relations is all about engagement. And, and how do you engage in a world where you can't be there um, in person? Now, now this is one example, right? Now we're on a Zoom together. Uh, we've got 50 plus people in the room. Um, it's a terrible weather day here in Baltimore and on the East Coast. So it's kind of nice that we can do this. Nobody had to get in their car. You pop on the screen. That's kind of great. Um, so what I'm curious to ask you all about is, what are some of the ways in which the pandemic has forced you to kind of create some creative marketing strategies and tactics and even events? And what do you think will stick around after uh, the, the pandemic is even over? And I'll start with you, Chris. Yeah, it's content, 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 content. Um, you know, we, we had a pretty uh, uh, robust group um, that made up our content team um, and, uh, and they worked Boy, they, they worked probably 10x of what they normally would in the summertime. Um, but it's also, it was, how can we keep reinventing ourselves? How can we keep finding new ways um, to, uh, to move advertising inventory into content that we controlled? And, um, and that, that's really been a great experience. I, I've been super impressed with many of the, the national and big brands out there um, that they haven't retreated and they're still spending money um, because they know the world will come back. And, um, and that's been really helpful. So, so in, that, in that realm, we certainly have uh, uh, focused in one particular area with, with the different um, uh, outlets of content, um, but we were able to move a large portion of our revenue and our business um, to adapt and and that has been that's been refreshing so uh uh i don't see it going away i see even when the world comes back um i think that this is the future you know we predicted that a couple of years ago we've been on this this trail but um we were really put to task uh uh out of the gates so uh that that's our game yeah chris i popped your instagram feed here from the sixers you got about two and a half million followers i think at the start so you know there's a there's a big audience here. And uh, what's been the strategy with content in this time? Obviously, I'm seeing here content about, you know, you got Doc Rivers and there's voting. And um, how do you, maybe this is an example of how to kind of get between keeping it light and uh, engaging in social uh, discussions. Yeah. And, you know, if you notice here, like some of this is, you know, like I said, we didn't have the ending of our season that we wanted. So we're protecting many of our players and, many crit and criticism towards them. So you see it, it's pushing towards our new coach and our get out to vote campaign and our um, support of, um, of social justice and, and other um, important topics uh, outside of basketball. So, but what we do try to make it light as well. And you'll start seeing like it easing into this. The, the 2.5 million Instagram followers you know, a year ago, we didn't have a million. Oh, wow. So it's like, th this thing is ramping up. And, and six months ago, I didn't know what TikTok was. Right. And, um, and now all of a sudden, even before the ocean spray guy, um, it was the, our guy, uh, Matisse Thibel was doing TikTok and it went viral. Mm. And so we jumped all, we jumped all one over. Of your players. Yeah. One of our players. And this is a guy that was a rookie and you know, non-starter, and um, he d became huge on the scene in the basketball world. Right. So, uh, so it's really been kind of fun to at least jump on the, the wave when, it, when it's out there. Yeah. I mean, how have you worked with your advertisers and, and sponsors in terms of uh, looking ahead to the 21 C 2021 season and what their engagement will be? Are there different ways you're going to kind of roll out sponsorship programs that speak to the moment and this? The, yeah, we, the, we, have, we, we created town hall, um, town hall meetings with our fans and um, we, we made it a sponsorable series. Um, we're doing other things of everything is sponsored um, that's tied into our, our social media and um, as well as other um, content platforms. And so, um, that's where we've been able to move our traditional signage and promotions on court and things like that, uh, all to content platforms. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, uh, 
what do you think, Jennifer, when people can't get together and you work with wineries and you're in Northern California and I know we've had the terrible fires to deal with this year, but um, in addition to the pandemics, it's been a difficult year and, and feel free to um, reflect on that with us. But I, I was going to ask about the whole virtual versus in-person thing. I know you work with, you know, destinations. Um, what, how have you adapted? How have they adapted? What might we see in the, in the next year in that regard? Yeah, it's been really tricky. I mean, it's been, um, to, for some context for everybody, the, it's where I live, it's a, a lot of hospitality and it, it depends on people coming up here in terms of like food and wine are huge. We've got a lot of great outdoor recreation, but then when you have the fires, you're not out hiking, you know, in the smoke and there are places that are closed. We've had evacuations. So it's been, it's been really challenging. Um, you know, I'm going to mirror and say content is huge. You know, that's a big part of it. And it's, and it's creating the content and it's also finding new ways to distribute it, you know, as well on your social platforms, but are there ways you can interact? Um, my big proponent of connected packaging, it's another screen you can deliver your content um, on any collateral that you have. There's QR codes, there's any, you know, there's any number of different ways. So I think, you know, that's mm -hmm. huge. I think there'll can be- Can I slow you down just for a second on connected <laughs> packaging and just define that for us? So I would say like AR, VR experiences or QR codes, which I think are, are great because you don't need an app now. You know, I would call that connected packaging too. So, you know, you can deliver whether it's food content and recipes, a backstory on your brand, on the people bringing your brand to life. It could be episodic. I mean, there's any number of different ways you can deliver your content in that way. So that's, that's what I mean by connected packaging. Um, but I think, I think those kinds of things are huge and will continue to grow. I, I believe there will be still a hybrid of sort of virtual and in-person. I just think that people are used to this and it's so, it is really easy. You know, I think we crave sort of being around each other, but I, but I don't think this is going away. And I think the technology while Zoom is, is, is really great, I think it will improve even more. The experiences will get better. There's certainly like a, a cost savings, you know, um, I think of having, you know, meetings like this versus in-person. So I do think that's gonna continue. Um, I, you know, I think there are more channels for retail than what there were before. So you can sell, you know, on online, you can sell on social. I think you guys probably saw TikTok, right? You know, so Walmart is investing in TikTok and then got a partnership with Shopify. I think influencers now feel like they're retail channels. So when you can't go in someplace and actually buy, you've got an influencer that's curated all these products for you. You can buy, you know, literally from them. So I think we're going to see more and more. So, you know, in terms of even shopping, it's, yeah, you want people to go in store. And I think that's always going to be there. But then you've got all these other channels that I don't think that's going away where people can shop and experience your brand. I think that, that's here to stay for sure, especially as we get more people working from home or sort of digital nomads, it's not about going to a particular destination and meeting with people. They can connect wherever they are. That feels, yeah. like, a feels like a permanent change. I think so too. I, I was listening to a uh, podcast the other day and it was someone who studies, uh, you know, the changes in our virtual world and the workplace. And what he said was that there's been a increase in by, by 10 years of the adoption of um, video conferencing and um, virtual engagement because of the pandemic. So that might be one of the, I don't want to say positive outcome, but just a, a sped up technology through necessity that I think will continue to impact us in the future. Mm -hmm. So um, it's so interesting because, you know, n none of that, we work with a lot of nonprofits and associations and everyone has to have, has had to cancel their conference. So a lot of the fundraising efforts, like when you're going to have a big concert in the park or you're going to have your, your 10Ks and all those things that raise money for nonprofits have had to be shifted to online or some, you know, creative uh, hybrid version. Um, so we're all having to think creatively and differently. And I think the, the thing I think is good in a way is like it forces you to figure out, well, since we can't be in person, what can we do? And mm -hmm. I think that opens up a lot of doors to creativity. Um, yeah. Vince, I know you've been thinking a lot about events and, and in-person versus virtual. What's what's happening in MindGrub in that regard? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we you know, a lot of what we did were in-person events. And, you know, we we do them very well. We get very granular and get our, our buyer in the room. You know, we're selling an expensive um, service and, and building a product. So we did that very well. And we've been able to successfully shift that um, to the virtual world. The one thing, and I echo everything that Chris and Jennifer said, um, the one thing that's also more powerful now than ever is the client testimonial. Um, it is more powerful than ever. Um, if you can get your client, because you're not going to go shake someone's hand 
um, to close that deal right now, having that client testimonial um, means more now than ever. I, I echo Jennifer, AR and VR are, are being adopted at a pace that I did not think we would see, but COVID has sped that up. 2D is not gonna do it anymore at home. Um, so AR and VR are gonna come into the household uh, more than ever. We're seeing more influx and inbound um, from companies and, and, and prospects trying to build AR and VR software. I never saw, thought I would see that in, in 2020. Yeah, give us some examples. Like, I, I haven't spent too much time playing around in that that world. Like, can you just talk about what we're going to start seeing in AR and VR? I think it's so cool, but I, I help yeah. us envision it. So I'll give you an example. A company might want to build an entire office workspace in a VR environment where employees in a VR environment can go sit down in your at your desk from their home in a VR environment. Um, right. And will it feel like I'm sitting next to my colleague? It'll, I usually sit it'll next feel, to you. It'll feel like you're, where we're going to get to is it'll feel like you're sitting next to your colleague. Oh um, we do work in the entertainment industry. I think Chris will, will agree with me that sports is going to adopt AR and VR in a big way. Yeah, we saw um, that in the playoffs, the right, Chris? There was the giant board on the side of the court in the NBA, and I think you had to register to be a fan, and it looked like you were there. Like, all these cardboard cutouts we're seeing at NFL games. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, Vince, but like, no, no, go ahead. I think it's fascinating to think about going to the game but not going to the game. But, Chris, you probably want to sell a ticket for that, so I'm not sure. Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah it's worth more in person, for sure. <laughs> but but you're right. I mean, we're always looking to see what everyone else is doing. Yeah. And sometimes you don't have um, the luxury of having the electronics uh, there and you're putting the old cardboard sign up. I thought uh, I, I've seen some some teams in different sports do it really well and others uh, not so well. Um, but we want to get creative. We're trying to think of new ideas of whether it is signage or placement. And But I, I agree that the virtual play, it was an experiment. Um, some of it was great. Some of it not so great. But uh, but it's all progressing. And, and we're not... We're going to be entering into it more as opposed to less. Yeah. Sorry, Vince. I think I kind of, you know, cut you off in the middle there because give us a couple of, you, you gave us the one example of virtual sitting next to your colleagues. What a, did you want to talk a little further about that? Like what else, what else might brands be doing in the virtual uh, environment? You're not going to be able to get out and, you know, visit your family and your friends during the holidays. Um, so companies are thinking about how can we connect and give an experience possibly an augmented reality. So you can take a picture at home, just for example, and then in augmented reality, you know, environment, mixed reality environment, put yourself next to your grandmother and your family, snap that shot and send that out as your holiday card because you can't take that picture um, in person. Those are the types of things that are possible um, that are just fast forward. COVID has sped all this stuff up. Um, right. So we're going to see AR and VR, mixed reality, um, adopted at a much higher rate than, than would have happened um, without us being at home for a year, year and a half, two years. Right. Necessity is the mother of invention. Um, okay. uh, you know, that, that's a good segue to the bold prediction segment of the uh, webinar today. And as we kind of, you know, get it past the, uh, towards the top of the hour, we got about uh, 19 minutes left with each other. Uh, everyone, um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to pop one in the Q&A, anything about marketing trends, what's working now, or um, a thought from one of our panelists on a challenge you're facing, we'd be happy to talk about. But let's just go around the horn here and, and talk about some predictions for the year ahead. Um, maybe, Jennifer, I'll start with you um, in the brands you're working with. And, you know, I know you study the marketing environment, especially for consumer brands. What are some big trends you think we'll see in 21? So I think the, the two things that I would, I would look at would be, um, one is restoring public trust. I think it's completely eroded this year. So if I were you know, listening to this uh, webinar right now and working in marketing and, and PR, I would say, wow, you really need to hold each other accountable. Make sure you're using the correct words. You're aligning with the right, the right partners, with the right influencers. Um, check your messaging. I think that's gonna be key. I think this is gonna be very tough to dig out from. I, I feel like, um, we're becoming a little more tribal 
I, you know, as, as a country, which is, which is not good. So going back to the, the, you know, certain people that we trust not being as open and a lot of that's because the information is, is not, you know, coming out correctly or it's, you know, everybody kind of has a different take on facts. And um, so I would be very careful on that, you know, ne next year. I think the other thing is I, I feel like as a, the workforce is fatigued right now. And so everybody's been so agile in 2020 and so quick to move that I feel like there'd be, a, there could be like a collective gasp at the end of the year and everybody just sort of relaxes, you know? And I, I think that any, you know, the brands, the companies are gonna do well in 2021 are the ones who continue to step on the gas, like do not stop innovating. I, I think that people are just so, they're so tired and we've all seen like the memes, um, you know, wanting 2020 out the door, but, um, but 2021, like keep on going and keep innovating, whether it's new channels, it's new business development, it's new stories, it's new products. Don't, don't just say 2020 is behind us and we're done and just relax, keep going. That's, mm. Those are the two I would say. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, how about for you guys? Uh, Vince, let's go to you. What, what kind of uh, trends do you think we'll be seeing in the year ahead? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with Jennifer. So first is don't forget the employee. Market to your employee. They're as important as your, your buyer right now, whomever that might be. Um, I don't think we're going to see um, in-person networking events as a way of business development truly return until sometime mid to the end of 2021. So you have to plan for that accordingly. And like I just said, AR and VR are going to explode. Um, we are going to see a total adoption of AR and VR um, because I don't really think people are going to be at the same scales before the pandemic um, yeah. ready to leave their homes until sometime after 2022. Yeah, um, I mean, can I just dig in on a, a little bit there? Like AR and yeah. VR are going to explode. Like for who? Like would that you do you need to for be the, a, a not giant all, national brand to get there, or can you do that? Yep. Can a smaller business think about that. So, so I'll give you an example. Uh, Nike will will roll out an app where you can take your your phone and you can kick out your foot. You can put the phone down, and you'll be able to see whatever sneaker looks like on your foot. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about not only retail, but I'm talking entertainment. And I'm talking everything. Um, AR and VR are going to be everywhere. You're going to be able to look at your TV and the image will be popping out. You know, this is the type of thing that is going to start happening um, that we have the ability to do it now. It, I know it sounds like we're talking about the future, but the adoption is speeding up at such a rapid rate um, that we're going to see these things on the market a lot sooner yeah. than the Sonys, the Samsungs, that everybody was ready to push them out. Right. Um, we used to wait for CES in January and then you'd see some of this crazy out there stuff. And I think it's hitting the market maybe sooner. Um, quick yep. follow up, Vince. Can, can B2B brands be thinking about AR and VR too? Or is it more of a consumer play? No, no, it's, it's both. So um, B2B, for example, um, I, I can't mention the, the client, but just imagine, you know, you're doing a walking tour of your favorite harbor and you can look out over the harbor and hold up your phone and see an experience of what the harbor looked like uh, 200 years ago with old ships in the harbor and things like that. Uh, content delivered and experience delivered. Um, these are the types of things that have been possible. It just wasn't adopted as quick as we thought it would be. COVID has sped it up um, tenfold. Yeah. Um, so, so look for it from B2B and B2C. Chris, let's go over to you um, at the 76ers across the NBA and maybe even across the sports world. What are you all talking about in terms of innovation in 21? Yeah, uh, I think there's going to be two things uh, that kind of stand out in my mind. Um, number one is something that we've been dealing with uh, since the beginning, and that was um, communication and many times over communication. So there's going to be the haves and the have nots. It's, it's the people that are getting out and being aggressive um, and uh, not hiding that are going to win this thing. And um, I think the ones that are hiding or sitting on their hands or cutting back, um, you know, for a better day um, are gonna get uh, surpassed when we, we come back. And, uh, and I do believe we're coming back. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that uh, I would, you know, I, I, who knows what my answer will be next week at this time, uh, <laughs> post-election, but, um, I think that's a, a huge um, wall right in front of us is this election and then probably uh, the aftermath, um, which will be about two months 
afterwards. It's going to be tri- tricky and hard, right. um, no matter what happens. Yeah. I think it's going to be hard. And so, um, but but the second big prediction there is that uh, I will say we are doing so much with the medical side. We're so deep into it, um, us on the NBA and, and team sports and events with testing and, and the like. I think that the vaccine will ultimately be our fast pass or easy pass um, to life as it was. And, and that'll be um, hopefully sooner than later, mm-hmm. uh, but probably sometime in the spring where um, people that are vaccinating, vaccinated are gonna be able to have very fast and easy access to the world. Yeah. I, that you know, I think we're all dreaming and hoping for that day to come as soon as possible. And uh, I had a meeting with a former client um, last week, earlier this week, and and he was talking about something similar to the theme you all are talking about, which is like you just you have to weather this storm and then be there for the rally because the rally is going to come. I think there's so much pent up need and and desire among everyone, no matter what industry you're in, to do things to get back to normal, to feel positive and optimistic while being aware of what's happening in the world. And so one of the things I'm feeling is like, it is time to, you know, plan for a, a better future while you manage this one. Um, and it's it's very challenging. The day-to-day is hard, but I, I like the idea of looking out because you can envision that future that is different and hopefully better than what we're living through. Um, even though what we're living through teaches us such important and interesting lessons. And so, um, I don't know, I'm just reflecting on everything you guys are saying. I really appreciate the insights you're bringing. Um, I'm picturing myself, Chris, driving up 95 to a Sixers game and I can't wait, but I, you know, we can't do it yet. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, are you lobbying to get first on the list? I'm sure. Well, you know me, I never <laughs> mind asking a favor. I'm lobbying for second, by the way. <laughs> John. Um, all right, let's take a couple questions that have come in. Um, as we approach 2021, marketing always seems to be the first place the C-suite looks to cut in their budgets. Uh, what are some things, metrics, momentum, et cetera, that marketers should be doing to prevent that kind of thinking? Uh, who wants to take that one? I'll throw it out there. How do you get the CEO to not cut the marketing budget? I'll take it, but I don't have a great answer because I struggle with this all the time. So I'll give you some... I'll give you some talking points and sort of some guidance. Um, and it's true, like you're you're absolutely right. It is the first thing to get cut. I I think there's a conversation that has to be made, right? So I think you have to find out from from the person in charge, from the executive team, the CEO, like what what does what like define success? I think that's at the very beginning. Like what what would mean we're successful? And then as a marketer, you have to back out from that because what I might think is successful is probably, it may not be what my boss thinks is successful. I mean, they tend to be a little more transactional. Oh, it's sales. Okay, so give me give me a number. What would be successful? What kind of growth are you looking for? And then you back out from there and develop a strategy. You know, I think the other thing is there are so many studies out there and there's so many articles and I'm happy to send this out to people that say how important marketing is. And, and how particularly during, you know, a time like this year when people were, you know, a lot of companies were pulling back on their marketing, they're the ones in five years who are not going to be as successful because they completely pulled back. And at a moment when there were so many eyeballs out there and so many people trapped at home looking for like, you know, you know, watching TV and listening to podcasts and everything and people and, and there were brands that just said, you know what, we're, we're done. It doesn't feel appropriate. We don't want to we don't want to spend the money there, right? So there are so many studies that say that's the wrong way to be, that if you want to be successful, it's times like this and times like next year that you should be marketing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that will help too with, you know, with your talking points with the CEO, like giving, I think, giving some, some case studies and research on that. But I think the big thing is getting, getting your, your team to define what success means. And then you can go back and sort of back into that with what's the right strategy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Chris, I, go ahead. Add in that, Greg, is like, um, you know, there's a reason the small businesses are getting crushed right now. Um, not only with the doors being closed and, and, and so forth, but like, this is an opportunity. If, if you can afford to, to market yourselves, it, it's going to catapult your brand. Um, I also think that there's no better time to get a better deal. So uh, you're, you're playing the long game. You get a better deal right now. You get aggressive with it and ask. Uh, for something that maybe you wouldn't ask for um, prior um, will uh, end up paying off. 
but uh, but this has got to be playing the long game. Not everyone has that luxury, uh, for sure. Um, but I think the ones that will come out on top uh, are going to get aggressive right now. Yeah, I love that point. And I mean, you do always see winners and survivors after a situation like this. Go ahead, Vince. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I couldn't agree with Jennifer more. A clear vision from leadership is always good for marketing, period, right? Um, but now is the time where you need to come up with just a lot of ideas. Um, if one doesn't hit, we're fortunate that we have a trifecta of distractions. Um, it might not be remembered as much the following day or the following week. Um, it, it's time to come up with as, you know, I, as many ideas as you can right now. Collaboration has, has never been more important, um, but it's a lot of ideas. Give a lot of things a try, um, but obviously a clear vision from the, the company and the brand, you know, you have to follow that as your, as your North Star. Yep, thank you. All right, let's take another question. With large festivals going virtual, seems based on our experience that sponsors feel that the investment is worth half regardless of added benefit. Uh, what about thoughts on that? If, you, if what you used to provide was a live experience, but you've had to go virtual, do you have to cut the uh, you know, cost to participate from the sponsor accordingly? Uh, Chris, that might be uh, in your wheelhouse. How have you dealt with that? Um, I was responding on the on the typing, Greg. Say that real quick again. So the question is, you know, festivals are going virtual. Think about a music festival. Um, based on experience, sponsors feel like investment is worth half regarding uh, the, the value, re regarding ha half regardless of our added benefits. So even if you get creative yeah. and you say, yeah. you're going to have a town hall and you're going to have access to our lists and you're going to be able to market directly to guests, whatever that is, um, the sponsors are saying, this can't be worth what it was worth when I was able to be there. So yeah. how do you price it? I think, you know, I, th I look at it, um, I look at it in this fashion. Um, A, you can always get creative and, and build more inventory, right? So an inventory is what, uh, value. The value of inventory is what you, what you think uh, someone will buy. So build more inventory, number one. Number two, and um, I think that you have to be, have real conversations with sponsors and advertisers out there where we've let people defer. We've pushed it off. Does mm -hmm. it help our business? No, not right now, but it will in a year. And so, Chris, does that fall in that category of ask for a deal? Like maybe you're just yeah. willing to negotiate? I, I, I think it's like, listen, all bets are off. <laughs> Right. And, and like, let, let's have a conversation. What yeah. are your objectives here? What are you trying to achieve? How can we solve that? If you can stick with us and I'd rather have somebody survive the year and be a sponsor with us next year than be dead now and have to try to find the money. Like yeah. it's, it's like maybe this gives us a chance to be reasonable once again and have conversations. Yeah. Um, we've got some banter going in the chat about finance versus marketing. And um, it's kind of funny because that, that question always does come up. The, the finance office wants to know, well, if we spend this, what are we getting back? And the marketing team says, look, you have to trust and invest and, and good things will happen. I can't always say exactly, but this is good business. And um, that's kind of an age old, you know, uh, battle that you fight as a marketer. Um, it's a marathon. Even, go ahead, Jen. <laughs> Like it's, it's, it, that's like with the most frustrating conversations because it marketing's a marathon. So you, you plan for it, but you can't drop out of the race like two miles in because you're not winning yet. That's ridiculous, you know, but that's like, it's a constant, um, I think it's a constant battle. It's like after every sort of campaign or everything that you spend, it's what did you get from it? What did you get from it? And the best brands of all time, you think about before there was measurement, honestly, like some of these really big, awesome brands were built. And I'll go back to like Nike, you know, for one, or Pepsi, Coca-Cola, like all these brands, they didn't have the form of measurement we had now, you know, they, they invested over time. They built these really great brands. They've got a lot of equity, um, but it feels like that's, that's lost a little bit now. So the good, the good finance people get that it's investment, but unfortunately not, you know, it's a conversation that happens a lot, you know, not everybody understands that. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that um, perspective. Well, we're getting towards the top of the hour. Maybe just one more question. Um, why don't I just throw out there anything we haven't gotten to that you all would like to add about uh, as you're planning for 21, some things you're thinking about. Um, Vince, what do you think? If uh, 
anything we haven't gotten to that's on mind grubs table or things you're working on with some of your clients that you think are interesting or different no, I mean, I, we touched a lot. I mean, we're, we're very fortunate. Um, we work across a lot of different industries um, and we help our clients with digital transformation. So we've touched just about everything and in, in seen about every um, type of project or idea in healthcare, education, entertainment, um, you know, uh, e-commerce, retail, um, all I can say is that we have to keep pushing forward. I know that sounds cliche, um, but it, it takes an intestinal fortitude right now um, to see that we will get beyond this. It was tough for me at the beginning. You know, I, I kept planning based on the fact that we're gonna be virtual forever. We're not gonna be virtual forever. Um, we will get back to a normalcy. So yeah. it's dealing with the, 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 the issue at hand, but also realizing that we will get to shake hands again one day. Um, we will be given hugs and, and get back in person. And I'm just trying to, to remind, you know, our team and personally that we'll get to the, the, the finish line on this thing and keep that in mind with every decision we make. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Chris, how about you at the Sixers? Just one quick thing on, you know, ways that uh, a brand or a sponsor could engage with the Sixers that they might not be aware of. Yeah, um, I think that everything's on the table. And creativity wins, uh, aggressiveness wins. Um, and we are playing uh, not only for now, but, uh, but down the road too. So, um, you know, and, and ultimately, I love what Vince said about, you know, market to your employees and market to your community. You start there and then everything else grows from it. But uh, it's, it's nice to have a reminder. And that was a, that was a good reminder. Thanks, Chris. And Jennifer, you can have the last word. Um, maybe just one thing we didn't get to that people can be thinking about as they look ahead to 21. Yeah, I think you, somebody mentioned it earlier, can you, can you be light and have fun? And I would say, yes, um, I think brands can still not take themselves too seriously. People need a break. And um, there's some really fun ideas that have come out this year and fun stunts and fun stories and fun content. And, and don't, lose sight, don't lose sight of that. Everybody gets sort of, this chaos can be overwhelming. Um, so have fun with your brands too. Thank you. That's a great way to end it. And it's 12 o'clock. So I'm just going to say thanks and we'll see you next time. We'll send out a recording and a thank you to everyone who is here and registered. Thank you. Thanks panel. You guys were awesome. I'll talk to you all soon. Bye.